Now, today's the fifth Sunday in a series that we're calling Renew, and we're going through the book of Judges and looking at some interesting characters. If you have your Bibles with you, I'm going to invite you to please turn with me to Judges chapter 10, and we'll start reading in verse 6. And uh, it is page 355 on the Bibles that we provide. If you didn't bring a Bible, just put your hand up. We'd love to run one to you right now. I'm going to wait just a few seconds for you to find that in your Bibles. Judges chapter 10. I love to see people looking up the text in the Bible. This is awesome. And we just do this because we're just so excited that when you go home, we would love to just uh, spark a habit of opening your Bible and reading your Bible a little bit every day to find the nourishment that you can only find in the Word of God. Let me uh, read it for you, starting in verse 6 of uh, Judges 10. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They served the Baals and the Ashtoreths and the gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. And because the Israelites forsook the Lord and no longer served him, he became angry with them. He sold them into the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites, who that year shattered and crushed them. For 18 years, they oppressed all the Israelites on the east side of the Jordan in Gilead, the land of the Amorites. The Ammonites also crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah, Benjamin, and Ephraim. Israel was in great distress. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord, we have sinned against you, forsaking our God and serving the Baals. And then I'm just going to skip down right now to the beginning of uh, chapter 11. So skip down now to chapter 11 with me. It goes on to say, Jephthah. The Gileadite was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when they were grown up, they drove Jephthah away. You're not going to get any inheritance in our family, they said, because you are the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob, where a gang of scoundrels gathered around him and followed him. Sometime later, when the Ammonites were fighting against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to Jephthah from the land of Tob. Come, they said, be our commander so we can fight the Ammonites. And we'll stop right there for now. So <clears throat> how many of you have seen the movie uh, Groundhog Day? Have you seen the movie Groundhog Day? Great movie. Yesterday was Groundhog Day, and uh, I've been thinking about that movie this week and getting ready for this message. The movie stars Bill Murray as Phil uh, Connors, a weatherman. And Phil wakes up uh, every single day, and it's the same day. It's over and over. It's the same day. It's February the 2nd. And he lives the same day for thousands and thousands of times. The alarm clock goes off at the same time he, uh, he, to the same song. He meets the same people, right? And he uh, does the same things over and over and over. And that movie has become so popular that the term Groundhog Day is now synonymous with things repeating themselves. People will say it's Groundhog Day to describe something that's a recurring event that happens over and over. If you've been tracking with us for the last few weeks, you'll notice that this story in the book of Judges is recurring over and over. There's a repetitive nature to the book as we've seen. And the same elements keep occurring. Rebellion that leads to ruin, followed by repentance that leads to renewal, and then rinse, repeat, right? And there's, a ta- there's actually a loop go- going on here. There's a cycle going on that really is a downward spiral, because as we go through the book of Judges, it gets worse. And the first verse of our story today begins then in a very familiar way. We have seen this again and again. It says, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And they served the Baals and the Ashtoreths and the gods of Aram and Sidon, Moab, the god of Ammonite and the god of the Philistines. In other words, they chased after every other god in that culture except for the one true god, right? Except for their own god, the Lord. And how many times have we seen this in Judges? It's Groundhog Day all over again. Now, as we've seen, and as we're going to see in the story again this morning, a strong feature of these false Canaanite religions is child sacrifice. And all of the gods that are listed here demanded that children be sacrificed as a burnt offering to them. And so, if the first step then in the cycle is rebellion like that, then it wouldn't surprise us that the second step is called ruination. And our story continues, and because the Israelites forsook the Lord and no longer served him, he became angry with them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies, and for 18 years, they oppressed the Israelites. Now, when it says here, God sold them into the hands of their enemies there, what it just means, it doesn't mean that God did this personally. It's not that God crushed them personally. It means that he removed his protective presence from them. And uh, you can think about it this way. When you sell something 
to somebody, you no longer control what happens to that. I mean, they can do with that thing what they want to do because you sold it into their hands. <clears throat> For example, Chris and I, we sold our home near the end of last year, and we've bought a home that's just a few blocks away. And there's this lovely Christian couple who have bought the house from us, and they're moving in on March the 1st. Now, once we hand over the ownership, we do not control what happens to that house, right? I mean, for example, they might take that beautiful wooden feature wall that we put up in our bedroom, and they might tear it down. They don't like it. Or they might get rid of the built-in bookcases that we installed in the living room, or they might get rid of the island that we put in the kitchen. <clears throat> that's their choice to do that. It might not have been what we would have done, but it's their choice to do it because we sold the house into their hands. And um, God is saying here, look, I just want to respect your choice. Okay, you've chosen that you don't want to live with me. You don't want to have a relationship with me. And so he says, I'm going to sell them, you, into the hands of those that you have chosen to serve, that you want to be in relationship with. And the natural result of serving the gods of their enemies is now they're going to be a slave of the servants of those gods. And it says this oppression lasted for 18 years. And finally, the people of Israel moved from the rebellion that leads to ruin into a stage that we call repentance. Or do they truly repent? See, that's the question. We're not quite sure. When we first read it, it sounds like maybe they do. It says the Ammonites crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah, Benjamin, and Ephraim. Those are tribes of Israel. Israel was in great distress. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord, we have sinned against you, forsaking our God and serving the Baals. So we see what moved them to confess that they've done wrong is that the Ammonites are on their northeastern border and have crossed the Jordan River and they're moving westward and they're about to attack and they're freaked out and so they cry out to the Lord. But are these real tears of sorrow or are these, as we call them, crocodile tears, you know? Are they truly sorry for what they've done or are they just sorry that they're in trouble? Well, it says, the Lord replied, <clears throat> when the Egyptians, the Amorites, Ammonites, Philistines, Sidonians, Amalekites, and the Mayanites oppressed you and you cried to me for help. Did I not save you from their hands? But you have forsaken me and served other gods. So I will no longer save you. Go and cry out to the gods you have chosen. Let them save you when you're in trouble. So God really sees the true state of their heart. He knows that they are not sorry at all. And uh, this is not a real state of repentance yet. And the story continues. But the Israelites said to the Lord, We have sinned. Do with us whatever you think is best. But please rescue us now. Then they got rid of their foreign gods among them and served the Lord, and he could bear Israel's misery no longer. Now, this uh, looks at least a little bit better. I mean, instead of just saying the words, we're sorry, they do something. They demonstrate uh, their repentance. They, they stop worshiping other gods. They no longer, I assume, offer their children in the sacrifice of, of fire. They serve the true God. But does this mean that they are truly sorry? Well, it's kind of hard to tell. Maybe they are, but the narrator doesn't tell us. The narrator just says that God couldn't bear their misery any longer. And God was moved to save his people. That's all we know. So we've got to hold off maybe right now on whether that repentance is genuine quite yet. Now, our story says that the Ammonite army camped out in the territory that the Israelites called Gilead. Okay, And the people of Gilead, up in the northeastern part of, of uh, Israel, they're so afraid, they are so desperate for somebody to lead their army that they ask the most unlikely person to lead them. Okay, So that's the end of chapter 10. Now, chapter 11 starts, as we read earlier, telling us a little bit of the background of this guy that they select to lead them against their enemy. It says, Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when they were grown up, they drove Jephthah away. You are not going to get any inheritance in our family, they said, because you are the son of another woman. And it continues into the next verse. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob, where a gang of scoundrels gathered around him and followed him. So the narrator here is beginning to shape Jephthah's character for us right off the bat. He's not a respected guy, okay? He's the son of a prostitute. He was driven away by his brothers um, when he was younger. 
out of his homeland, given no inheritance. And this was all done, we find out later, with the whole support of the elders of their community. And Jephthah then leads a life of crime with a bunch of other scoundrels. So one commentator I read compares him to a, a mafia boss, you know? And Jephthah is this mean hombre who leads a gang of, you know, scoundrels. So let's say we would probably not expect this guy to be the leader of Israel anytime soon, right? Except the situation is desperate. And what do they say about desperate times? They call for desperate measures. That's right. And so uh, this guy knows how to fight. This guy has an experience commanding soldiers. And so it says the elders of Gilead went to Jephthah from the land of Tob. Come, they said, be our commander so we can fight against the Ammonites. But now Jephthah, he doesn't just want to be their army commander. He wants to be their leader, see? So he negotiates for himself a very sweet position before he'll lead them into battle. And there's something important I want you to see here, because as we go through here the story, as we learn about Jephthah, we're going to notice some strong similarities between how the people treat Jephthah in chapter 11 and how the people treated God back in chapter 10, okay? So back in chapter 10, the people reject God. And here in chapter 11, the people reject Jephthah. In chapter 10, the people are in trouble, and they ask God, come and rescue us and lead us. And in chapter 11, the people are in trouble and they ask Jephthah to come to their rescue and lead them. In chapter 10, God can tell the people don't really want him to be their leader. They just want his help. So he rebuffs their request. In chapter 11, Jephthah can tell the people don't really want him to be their leader. They just want his help. And so he rebuffs their request. It says in verse 7, Jephthah said to them, Don't you hate me? Or didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? In chapter 10, you'll remember the people reinstated God as their leader, but not just with words, but with deeds as well. There was a response. And in chapter 11, Jephthah negotiates with the people. It doesn't just take their word for it that they're going to make him uh, their leader after he defeats the Ammonites, he requires their response right now. More than just words, they have to do something that he wants them to do. Verse 9, Jephthah answered, suppose you take me back to, f um, to fight the Ammonites and the Lord gives them to me. Will I really be your head? The elders of Gilead replied, the Lord is our witness. We will certainly do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and commander over them. And so in both situations, the people had to do something and not just talk about it. So there's a recurring element here that we can see. It is, as we say, it's Groundhog Day. Um, when we come across a narrative technique like this, okay, I want you to hear this. When you come across a narrative technique like this, where you see one event and then you see a similar event with the same elements in it, okay, you need to know that that's intentional, all right? These stories are very, very carefully crafted. And the comparison here is too obvious for us to ignore. And when it comes to drawing the meaning out of the text, something to keep in mind is that the similarities between the stories are given for the purpose of making the differences obvious. Let me say that again. I'm going to put it up on the screen. Write this down, okay? This is so helpful for you to understand how ancient Hebrew texts like we have here in the book of Judges, how they were shaped, how to read them. This is an interpretive technique. The similarities between the two stories in chapter 10 and then chapter 11 are provided in order for you to see the differences clearly. Okay? So you want to compare it. We've already looked at the similarities, haven't we? And we've seen how there's lots of similarities between how the people treat Jephthah and how they earlier treated God. The people reject both God and Jephthah. The people ask both God and Jephthah to rescue them. Both God and Jephthah know that they're not really sorry for rejecting them, and so they rebuff their request. And in both events, the people have to do something in response. Talk is not enough. So now what we have to do when we see all the similarities is we have to ask ourselves, where is the difference? And if there are similarities in these stories that are given to make the differences obvious, what's the difference between the two stories? Here's the difference. Back in chapter 10, the narrator tells us, and the Lord could bear Israel's 
misery no longer. See, unlike Jephthah, who's in, he's into this for selfish gain, okay? God is in this because he loves his people. Unlike Jephthah, who just wants to secure the lost power and his lost rights and his lost status among his people, God genuinely cares about his people. That's the difference, and that's what we need to see. Now, do the people ever really, truly repent to God back in chapter 10? It, initially, it looked like they may have done that, but was that just crocodile tears? Well, I suggest to you, like the people asking Jephthah to be their leader, they don't want God because they truly love him and they want to serve him. They just want God because he's powerful and he can save them. But, but here's the deal. Just because the people in chapter 10 are, are a lot like the people in chapter 11 does not mean that God in chapter 10 is a lot like Jephthah in chapter 11. God knows that these people are not really sorry for rejecting him, but his heart is still tender toward them. Isn't that great? God can't bear their misery any longer. And I hope that this truth about God's character and this truth about God's love is going to inspire your worship later on this morning as we sing to the Lord. He's such a good and merciful and loving Heavenly Father. My prayer is that we won't just know about God, but that we will know God personally. So now God raises up this leader, but as we've seen before in the book of Judges, he is a flawed person. And just because God raises him up does not mean that God approves of everything he does, right? But to his credit, Jephthah gets a pretty good start. And he begins by trying to negotiate peace between him and the king of the Ammonites. It says in verse 12, Then Jephthah sent messengers to the Ammonite king with a question, What do you have against me that you have attacked my country? Verse 13 gives the reply. The king of the Ammonites answered Jephthah's messengers. When Israel came up out of Egypt, they took away my land from the Arnon to the Jabbok all the way to the Jordan. Now give it back peacefully. So there's this historical dispute now that the Ammonite king raises here. He raises a question about events that took place generations earlier, back when Moses was leading the people from Egypt into the promised land. And the king of the Ammonites, he says, look, when your forefathers came out of slavery in Egypt, and you came into this land, you took it away from my people. You took it away from my people, now give it back. And what Jephthah says to him over the next 13 verses, let me summarize, it is actually a very educated and accurate response. In a nutshell, Jephthah really knows his Bible here. He really knows his history. It says, Jephthah sent back messengers to the Ammonite king saying, this is what Jephthah says, Israel did not take the land of Moab or the land of the Ammonites, but when they came out of Egypt, Israel went through the wilderness. And what Jephthah goes on to say here is a very accurate rendering, in fact, of what actually took place as described in the law of Moses. And he says something like this, look at what happened really was the Israelites asked for permission to travel through the land. And we were told, no, you can't do it. And and then the king attacked us. So you, you, you attacked us, and then we defended ourselves, and our God delivered us, and we won the victory. And Jephthah says, we didn't attack you. You attacked us. We didn't take anything away that we didn't know, and our God gave us this land. And he says, no, you wouldn't give up the land that your God gave you, and we're not going to give up the land that God gave us. So it actually amazes me that this son of the prostitute, this leader of scoundrels, is actually such an educated and biblically accurate guy. This is the high point of Jephthah's leadership. And at the end of this response to the Ammonite king, he wraps up with this beautiful word of faith in God. He says, I have not wronged you, but you are wronging me by waging war against me. Let the Lord, Jephthah says, the judge decide the dispute this day between the Israelites and the Ammonites. Jephthah trusts his life and the future of his people into the hands of the Lord. And here we see the reason why this you know, very otherwise flawed guy ends up in the hall of fame of faith of Hebrews chapter 11. His, his name shows up there and we see why now. Well, the Ammonite king doesn't respond and he doesn't go away. And so it says, then the spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh, passed through Mitzvah of Gilead, and from there he advanced against 
the Ammonites. So what's going on here is God is with him. He's guaranteed the victory. The people have been horribly oppressed for 18 years. And praise God, that oppression is about to end. And it's a wonderful high moment of triumph. But as we know by now in the book of Judges, as we know by now in the book of Judges, that is not going to last very long. Because God is working with some incredibly messed up individuals here. And so Jephthah is no exception to that rule. In the heart of the battle, in the heat of the battle, it says, and Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. This is what he says. This is the vow. This is the promise he makes in the heat of battle. Now, let's be super clear here. This is not something that God wants, okay? This is not something God asked for. God does not want to be manipulated and bribed with your promises of what you're going to do in order for him to make good on his promises. You see what I mean? I mean, Jephthah is importing a pagan understanding of God into his prayer life right now. He's operating with a pagan worldview. The gods of the Canaanites operate that way. You got to bribe them. You got to promise the moon to them in order for them to do what they promise to do. But this is not what God's looking for. Why would Jephthah do this right after recounting such a beautiful, accurate version of biblical truth? Could it be that Jephthah knows part of the law of God, but he doesn't really know the Lord? The Lord is very different than the false gods of the culture around him. He doesn't need an oath in order to make good on his promises. But Jephthah doesn't seem to know this. He tries to bribe the Lord, not even realizing he's already won the victory. What's going on here? I would suggest to you that Jephthah is a guy who he knows his history, but he doesn't know his God. He knows some of the scriptures, but he's never really gotten to know the Savior of his people. Jephthah knows part of the law of Moses, but he doesn't know the Lord of glory, or he never would have made such a terrible promise. Now, I've tried to imagine what's going on in Jephthah's head here, okay? When he says, whatever comes out of my house to meet me when I come home, okay? Who did he think that was going to be? Does this guy hate his dog? You know? I'm, I'm left to wonder, has his marriage, as they say, lost that loving feeling? I mean, what is going on? Why would you make that kind of promise? I mean, who do you expect to come out to meet you? I don't know what to think. I'm betting that he just did it in a totally thoughtless way. Thoughtlessness is what's going on here. And the good news is that God actually anticipated that stuff like this would happen because back in the book of Leviticus in chapter 5, God writes this, if anybody thoughtlessly takes an oath to do anything, whether good or evil, but then they learn of it and recognize their guilt, they must bring to the Lord a female lamb or a goat from the flock as a sin offering, and the, peace, the priest shall make atonement for them for their sin. See, there's a substitute there that's provided of a lamb or a goat. If you do something stupid, like make a promise, that you should never have made. Now, the bad news, as we've seen, is that Jephthah has made a stupid promise. The good news is that God knew that people were going to make stupid promises. And he made it, made it super clear that if you made a dumb vow, you sacrifice to the Lord instead. You don't go through with the vow. You give a sacrifice. God is merciful. God is a forgiving God. And he knows people are going to make these kind of of thoughtless promises, and he has provided a way out of your stupid vow. Isn't that nice of him? And Jephthah, would, he would know this if he only knew the Lord. But he doesn't know the Lord. He doesn't know what kind of a merciful and loving father he's dealing with. And so after he's victorious, and he defeats the Ammonite army, it says, when Jephthah returned to his home in Mitzpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter dancing to the sound of timbrels? She was an only child, except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, oh my daughter, you have brought me down, and I'm devastated. I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. Now, we've already seen Jephthah's wrong. You can break that vow. You made that vow. That was a dumb vow. You can break that vow. God didn't want that vow in the first place. Break that vow. But he doesn't know the Lord. 
And he doesn't know what the Lord wants. And either does his daughter. My father, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised. Now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites, but grant me this one request. She said, give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends because I will never marry. See, Jephthah and his daughter don't realize something that is incredibly important. Talk about a Groundhog Day moment. This is something that the Bible goes over again and again and again. It is so repetitious in the scriptures. How can we meet? How can we miss this? The truth of the matter, friends, is that God always accepts a substitution. Say that with me. God always accepts a substitution. One more time. God always always accepts a substitution. This is why the story is told in Genesis 22, where God tells Abraham, go up on this mountain and sacrifice your son to the Lord. Now, God never intended that Abraham was going to actually sacrifice his son. He just wanted to make a point that he will always, always provide a substitution for sin. Abraham obeys the Lord and he takes his son up the mountain And he goes to sacrifice him. Why? Because that's just what every single God demands. Of course. But God wanted Abraham to know that I am different. I will never, never demand the life of a child to atone for your sin. God always accepts a substitute. He provided there in Genesis 22 a ram instead of Isaac. And he provides here a lamb or a goat to die instead of Jephthah's daughter. In Judges, if Jephthah only knew the Lord's heart, he would say, you know what? It's a good thing the Lord accepts a substitute when I say the stupidest things. Would you like a lamb or a goat for dinner? But he doesn't know the Lord's heart. If his daughter just knew the Lord's heart, he would say, Dad, don't worry. God never wants a human sacrifice. He always provides a substitute for our sin. But she doesn't know him either. And so they do the unthinkable. Our story this morning ends with these sad words. You may go, he said. And he let her go for two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept because she would never marry. After the two months, she returned to her father. And he did to her as he vowed. Sadly, Jephthah is a guy who knew some of the law but he didn't know the heart of the Lord. He didn't know how God always works with his people. He didn't realize that God always, again and again and again, like Groundhog Day, always provides a substitute for our sin. He didn't know. My friends, what does this have to do with us today? I want to emphasize to you in the strongest possible terms as we prepare our heart to participate in the Lord's Supper, We need to be reminded that the sacrifices in the Old Testament were only a symbol of that which would come later. When Jesus died on the cross, he met, he satisfied all the righteous demands of God. He atoned for sin, that is, he paid the appropriate penalty for our sin as our substitute on our behalf. He took what we should have endured. He made the appropriate payment for the sins that were committed in the Old Testament and afterwards. And today we know that Jesus is the ultimate, the final, the only true substitutionary sacrifice for sin for all time. Romans 3 makes this so clear. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's you, that's me. We're all like Jephthah. And we're justified. How? Freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Jesus. See, we've all sinned. We have said things that we should never have said. We've made promises that we should never have made. God, the good news, is willing to forgive you. He is willing to consider you to be sin-free. That's what justification means. To declare you to be righteous in his sight. How? It's a gift of grace. Not because you earned it. Not because you deserved it. Not because you were a good enough person. Not because you walked a few old ladies across the street last week. You just accept it as a free gift. And then you don't have to suffer the penalty of eternal death for the wrong things that you've done. Now, isn't that a great deal? Isn't he a merciful God? Now, does this mean, well, God, I guess, doesn't care about sin? Maybe it doesn't matter what we do. Not at all. 
Remember that God allowed the punishment for our sin to fall on somebody else. His own son, our substitution. And the Bible says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. My friends, like Jephthah, we got to know this. That's the first step. Secondly, like Jephthah, we have to receive it. We have to believe it and we have to receive it. The Bible says you receive it. It's a free gift by faith. My question for you today is simply, do you know that God always provides a substitute for your sin? And if you do know that, have you accepted the substitution of his son who died on your behalf when he died on the cross? Have you believed in this? Have you placed your faith, your trust in this? My friends, there's so many people I know, they consider themselves to be Christians, but they have never received Christ. They have some knowledge of the stories in the scriptures. They do not know the Savior. They know a little of the law like Jephthah. They do not know the Lord. Is this you? Have you come to the place where you've personally placed your faith in the atoning death of Jesus who died as your substitute? I want to give you a chance to do that today because he loves you and he wants to have a relationship with you and he doesn't want you to be separated from his love for eternity, but you must respond by accepting it by faith. Now I tell you this because 20 years ago on this exact day, on, on February the, the 3rd of 1999, something very tragic and something very wonderful took place. And so it was my first day on the job here at Gateway. That was the wonderful thing. And as I mentioned, this is the exact anniversary of my first day of ministry. And I woke up early in the morning to the sound of our phone ringing, and it was my mother. And through tears, she choked over on the phone to me that my best friend, Bill, who grew up right across the road from me, the kid that I spent time with every single day. We would do my chores after school in the welding shop, and then we'd go over to his house, and we'd do his chores in his dad's barn. This was the kid who was my best friend. Uh, his parents were like a mom and dad to me, okay? I get a call from my mom. Bill just died the previous night in a car accident. And I spent my first day of ministry here at Gateway, driving up to Owens Sound, and visiting Bill's mom and dad and giving them a hug and crying with them. And when I drove back that night, late that night, my first day on the job, I made a promise to the Lord. I don't think it was a rash vow like Jephthah, but I made a promise and I said, God, if you allow me to be the pastor of this church, I will do my best. As, you, as your spirit helps me, I will do my best to challenge people to receive the free gift of God's grace. I do not want there to be one single person who come to Gateway Church who does not know this, that God always provides a substitute. And that you are eternally lost if you don't accept that free gift of his grace. I said, God, as you help me, I will make that message clear. That happened 20 years ago today because I had such a stark reminder that life is short and what matters is not just knowing the scriptures, but personally knowing the Savior. And I promised the Lord on that drive home 20 years ago that I would share the gospel of Jesus until my dying day because there's only one way to have a relationship with God and there's only one way to have eternal life. There is only one way to get to heaven and is that is through Jesus Christ and through faith in him. My friend, if you're here and you don't personally know Jesus as your Savior, or if you have wandered away from your first love, if you have yet to receive by faith the free gift of God's grace, if you would like Jesus to be your substitute, that he would pay the penalty of your sin on your behalf, please, I just can't emphasize this enough. Would you pray with me? Would you please stand right now?